Us joining us right now is former Deputy Chief of Staff for President George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor, Carl Rove. Carl, good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. You bet. Thanks All right, for so having start me. Start with the big meeting today. What does President Trump need to accomplish here? What do you expect comes out of it? Well, look, it's the first meeting, so don't lower your expectations. Uh, but it, uh, they need to establish the relationship. And then my suspicion is the Canadians are going to be very eager, as are the Mexicans and other trading partners, to get a better sense of what exactly President Trump thinks is wrong with the trade agreement. I mean, we do have a, uh, a, a, a good s uh, deficit with Canada, but I think we actually have a surplus in trade in in trade of services and overall I think the overall uh, relationship with this uh, with Canada is is pretty close to even unlike with Mexico so I think the Canadians are going to probably be very eager to say specifically what is it that you don't like about the deal Mr. President. Um, Mr. Rove, Kirsten Hagland here. So they've got a, a full agenda today. One of them is actually a, a roundtable with women, um, working women. And, of course, President Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau are polar opposites on this issue, as well as many others. But uh, Ivanka That's Trump with Paul Ryan, also, right? right? Paul, Paul um, Ryan is doing the, the women's meeting? Right. So, well, it says, it says true. I mean, Paul Ryan is going to meet with them, President Trump as well. And so what do you expect to be involved in that, in that roundtable? Because we haven't really seen a lot of comments on women. And this is something that Donald Trump has had to be very specific about, you know, coming out and... Yeah. You know, fighting some of the accusations that were made about him on the campaign trail. Yeah. Well, Justin Trudeau calls himself a feminist. Half the Canadian cabinet is women. Uh, and so it's going to be an interesting, this is going to be an interesting meeting. This meeting is probably on the U.S. side an expression of Ivanka Trump's uh, interest in the issue and, uh, and, and her, uh, and an aide inside the White House, former colleague of mine in the Bush White House, Dina Powell former Goldman Sachs banker who's very interested in advancing uh, women entrepreneurship and women ownership and, men and women management of companies. So there's gonna be, it's going to be a very interesting meeting with, that involves both Canadian and American women business leaders to talk about what must be done to expand opportunities for women in the higher ranks of management as well as in entrepreneurship. So it'll be an interesting meeting, but it's an expression of the importance that attached to this by the first daughter, uh, Ivanka Trump. Carl Buck Saxton here. I wanted to ask you if you think that in light of Donald Trump pushing forward uh, on pipelines, at least signing executive orders saying they'll go forward, including Keystone XL, that's obviously been in the wings for a long time, connects literally and economically the U.S. Uh, to Canada. Do you think that energy is a place where maybe these two uh, unlikely friends might actually find some common ground? Yeah, but not as. What's interesting is remember these pipelines began when Prime Minister Harper was in office. He was a he was from the energy rich west of Canada, and this was an important issue to him. I suspect it's still important to Justin Trudeau, but he is more of an environmentalist, more skeptical of 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 the of the importance of the Canadian economy of hydrocarbons, oil and gas, and uh, and and a climate uh, change advocate. So I'm not certain it's near the top of his agenda. I think he's going to be far more concerned about you know what might happen to that to that sort of uh, manufacturing base that is with, in the, uh, starts across the river from Detroit and runs up into Canada to the east. He's going to be worried about what about those jobs, less worried about the jobs out in the far west in, in uh, energy. But look, this is a good economic benefit for both us and them. Uh, right. That oil would be sold someplace, that, and now they don't need to go create a gigantic uh, pipeline to the to the Vancouver coast in order to send it to China. They can send it to the U.S. markets, and we can send, use it in our uh, refineries in the in the Gulf Coast, uh, which are sort of engineered for this kind of heavy crude that's coming out of Canada. Carl Rove, Lauren Simonetti here. The the trade and the relationship situation at the north part of the border and the south are very different. How do you, what are the chances of us getting a bilateral agreement here with Canada? And so renegotiating well, NAFTA, but really having a bilateral agreement between the U.S. and Canada separately. Well, uh, the, the, the question there would be what, what, you can't have two agreements that might conflict with each other. So you could have a bilateral agreement that's additive, uh, that, that is to say explores new areas. And President Trump is clearly an, a, a proponent of, of uh, bilateral agreements rather than multilateral agreements, even though uh, NAFTA is essentially three parties. He'd rather be doing two-party deals. But if there is something with Canada, it's going to be aimed at, at resolving specific things that, that are either unaddressed or ill-addressed in, in NAFTA. And it would uh, probably take the uh, form of uh, adding the new things and then modifying the old things and then requiring changes in the NAFTA agreement to, to bring them into uh, conformity with that bilateral agreement. But we're going to see a lot more emphasis on bilateral agreements uh, going forward. 
And, and trade policy is going to be one of the most interesting things for this new administration because you, even within uh, the, the Trump administration, you have sort of you do have free traders, but you also have uh, trade hawks whose basic view is we believe in trade, uh, but we want everybody to live by the same rules. And then you have some more sort of mercantilist views that say the only good trade agreement is when you buy more from us than we buy from you. <laughs> and there's going to be conflict among all three elements of those as we go forward. All right, a couple of other headlines I want you to just give us your take on. We know that the Senate is going to have time to debate Steven Mnuchin's nomination for Treasury Secretary. It's likely that it'll get confirmed tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. What will his confirmation mean for the administration? And then, of course, characterize what you saw over the weekend. We've been looking at pictures of the president with uh, the head of Japan, Shinzo Abe, uh, they were having a good time, it looks like. Should we be yeah. reading into that, what that means for trade with Japan? Well, first, let's start with Mnuchin. I, I wrote about this in my Wall Street Journal column. I thought the Democrat performance during his confirmation hearing in front of Senate Finance was unworthy of a minor uh, uh, fourth or fifth party in, in a, a Latin American uh, kleptocracy. I, I mean, totally these were agree, Carl. The questions they were, were ridiculous. Dreadful. Yeah, they, they were dreadful. They were dreadful. Uh, and so, look, this will be. The, this means that the big three: state, defense, and treasury will be filled. Uh, it, what I'm really excited, and that'll happen tonight, finally. Uh, but also, Mnuchin is working on putting together a staff and uh, the other key officials there. And I've heard some names that I know. Jim Donovan is a fantastic individual who bring a lot of skill and ability and talent and integrity and intelligence. Uh, David Malpass is a terrific economist, a great ex he's one of his great skills is to take these very complex economic issues and, and boil them down so you can get your hands around them. He's also very good at laying out what the various options are. I think these are two terrific choices and an early sign that Mnuchin is going to be a great secretary um, you know the uh, the, 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 the rest of the, of, of the of, of what we're facing in Washington is sort of getting bollocked up here with uh, with some of what uh, is going on in Congress and then some of the sort of the PR stuff that the administration is having to handle but it looked but, like uh, it was but, a good meeting with him and Shinzo Abe I mean just oh, looking Ab at Abe, the picture oh yeah Abe was terrific and look here's the deal I, I learned something when I was at the White House that I w did not expect to be the case, and that is the personal relationship between the President of the United States and, and uh, foreign leaders, particularly uh, our allies. That personal relationship matters far more than you would have thought. You would have think that, you know, I'm the leader of America, I'm the leader of Japan, we have interests that are in common, we have interests that might clash, uh, we, we look at this in a very sort of uh, policy driven way. But yeah, that happens. Yeah. But the personal relationship matters. That's why uh, inviting Abe down to Mar a Lago and playing golf with him was a terrific move, and the two men seem to have hit it off, and that's important. Bush had a similar relationship with the uh, Prime Minister. Minister of Japan, and it made a great deal of difference. And you know, you you can speak candidly. You get more, it, we can advance our interests more. We can find common ground easier, and that's all to the good. So yeah. I thought it was a great weekend meeting.